So this is your official welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us for a Dash of Florence cooking show hosted by our very own Florence director, Frank Nero. We are very excited for today's program. This is part of Study Abroad Week, which is part of FSU's larger celebration of International Education Month. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us to spend your afternoon making some delicious pasta with us. Um, so with that, just welcome and enjoy. I will turn it over to Frank. Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> welcome to Florence. We're coming live at you today from the from FSU's uh, Via Romana residence. We were originally planning to do this at the study center, but because of unforeseen circumstances, we had to switch it over to one of our residences. If there are any former students, I'm sure you know Via Romana, the Via Romana student kitchen very well. And See, how can I see this? And we're going to make today a very authentic Italian recipe. Its origins probably date all the way back to the 1600s. And we have a few variations on it because from my experience in Florida, perhaps some of the exact ingredients uh, are hard to get, you have to go to a specialty store, you just couldn't pop into Publix and get them. So we got the proper substitutes that will more or less make the dish as authentic as it can be. Wearing my FSU Florence t-shirt for the occasion, you guys can see that not only our logo and symbol is the Florentine Fleur de Lis, but this is also the symbol of Florence, which suggests a uh, new birth, new life. And what we're sort of banking on is that when all this COVID craziness is over, we'll have a rebirth of international programs, especially here in Florence, because we have a brand new study center that will open this spring, this January, and I've been talking to some colleagues here in Florence that run other study abroad programs. And basically FSU now is known for having not one of the best, the best uh, American facilities here in, in all of Italy, not just Florence. So we're excited about that. And we hope that if you've been here before, many of you will be able to come visit us. And hopefully there's some future students that are thinking about coming to study abroad in Florence uh, on today's program. So what I wanted to do first is go through the ingredients with you guys. And then after we go through the ingredients, I have a small little shop slideshow that basically talks only five or six slides that talks about a little bit of the history of this dish. Not only am I the director of FSU Florence, but I also, uh, I also teach the history of art. So I love the history of all things, including cuisine. Um, we do have international food and culture classes, international wine and culture classes that we offer every semester here in Florence. I'm not the instructor for those courses, um, an amateur. Uh, the few dishes that I know, I learned by either reading, but uh, most specifically, just watching Italian families that I've been fortunate enough to live with or to uh, cook with. And basically I picked it up just by practicing and observing and uh, reading a little bit. And over the years, I think I've gotten pretty good at this one. A particular dish, bucatini alla matriciana. So after we talk a little bit about the history, then we'll get to the actual cooking. And then of course, my favorite part, the eating. I'm actually breaking my diet here. I'm on a seafood diet. If I see food, I eat it. So um, when you guys come to Italy, my experience from past students, 
as well as my own experience. I don't know how many of you guys know this, but I'm an FSU alum and I actually did the Florence program back in 94. So I'm sort of a living testament how the program can change somebody. I sort of dedicated my life to coming back to Florence, but uh, it wouldn't be the same without uh, being connected to Florida State. I would have never come back to Florence if I had an opportunity to work with the program that launched my love for, for the city and for Italy. So I'm going to, I have a movable camera, so hopefully you don't get seasick. You know, we have to sort of ad lib and go ad hoc uh, when we moved everything into the residence kitchen. So I'm gonna grab the camera now and we're going to go through the ingredients. So the pasta that we use time here, it's called bucatini. It's a pasta that's mainly used in Rome. Sometimes this could be a little controversial, what pasta you use. Um, we'll get into that a little later. But bucatini is a sort of fixed spaghetti. And in fact, some Italians swear that you shouldn't use bucatini, that you should use spaghetti instead. So if you have spaghetti, spaghetti is just as good as bucatini. So you'll need your can of peeled tomatoes. And pomodori pelati, that pelati means peeled. If you don't have peeled tomatoes, like regular uh, crushed tomatoes work just as good, because eventually we'll crush these up in the pot. Then you need pecorino romano cheese, which is this one right here. Um, you could usually find this in Publix in the deli section in the fridges that they got there. So we probably won't use all of this. We'll probably use maybe half or two thirds of it. So hopefully you have a nice block of pecorino cheese. And then what we, another controversial ingredient, the onion. Now you don't have to use a red onion. You could also use the white onion, you could use both. So if you have a white onion, you could take that out. I like the red a little better, has a little more zig to it. So that's what, I usually use. Another controversial, controversial ingredient, we'll get to why it may be controversial in just a little bit. Then we have sort of the ingredient that makes the dish, and that is pancetta. You can get pancetta in Publix, also in the deli section. It comes in little plastic crates, just like you see here. Um, very similar to bacon. Actually, it comes from the same part of the pig that bacon does. So if you can't find pancetta at Publix, you can use bacon. And of course, for those of you who want to use bacon, I got a little slab here. Also, if you like that fire, if you like that spice, part of the original recipe is also hot pepper. Now I love that fire. I love that tang, that zing in my sauce. So I always use hot pepper. So if you have uh, hot pepper flakes, that could work too. This is basically what this is, only we're going to chop this up. Uh, if you have the whole dried hot peppers like I do, um, you just chop it up, skin and all, that's what gives it the flavor. We also need a little black pepper, as you can see here, and some salt. And we'll talk about the salt a little later. Of course, what's integral to every Italian dish is a little olive oil, extra virgin, preferably, but any kind will work, especially since we're cooking with it. And you need about a glass like this of white wine. You can see this awesome glass that I got to try to get uh, garnet and gold colors. Now, if you're under 21, you could also use cooking wine, which they do sell in Publix, sort of like in the condiment section, and that could work just as well. So you could be under 21 and definitely make this dish, 
And just to say, by the time you put the wine in the sauce and it cooks off and evaporates, all the alcohol is gone anyway. So you won't be getting uh, uh, drunk and breaking the law. So these are our basic ingredients. And before we get into some more stuff, I think you better get your pot ready for boiling the pasta. Fill it up with water, maybe about two thirds of the way especially if it's big. Now this stove here in the residence sort of takes a long time. So I had it pre-boiling a little bit and I'm going to get it going again, put it on high. Now, because by the time we get through all the preparation and everything, we want to make sure that uh, our pasta is, our pasta water is boiling. So I'm going to set the camera back up and as the water begins to boil, before we start chopping and going through all of the ingredients, I already alluded to the fact that this was supposed to take place in the study center. That's because in our study center, we actually had installed, when we renovated it, a cooking space, a professional kitchen with five stations where up to 20 students can cook together uh, in the back of the new study center for our hospitality programs, for students that come and want to take an international food and culture class, so on and so forth. One of the highlights of the study center. And this was the idea of our associate director, Lucia. And it was Lucia who was the brains and the, and the uh, talent and the taste behind renovating this uh, new study center and making it sort of a state-of-the-art place to get a hands-on experiential uh, education abroad. But at the same time, even if it's state-of-the-art, it puts us within the context of old Italy. So I just want to share my screen a little bit and show you guys what I'm talking about. Here's the PowerPoint. Let's bring that up. And we'll do a slideshow from the beginning. There's our school, as you guys saw. And for those of you that haven't been to Florence, you don't know what you're missing. And I'm putting this next picture up to make you go ooh and ah so that you seriously think about coming. This is a picture from a little overlook over the city called the Piazzale Michelangelo. So Michelangelo Plaza. Michelangelo, the famous artist, was from Florence. And you can see how beautiful it is here at this picture at sunset. Water is boiling, so sorry for that noise there. And these buildings that you see here in the cityscape are, of course, the highlight of the city of Florence, where every step that you take in the streets, you're surrounded by these structures, some of the most famous in the world, that date back to the 1300s, the 1400s, the 1500s. And Florence is known as the cradle of the Renaissance, and these buildings are a testament to that a fossil to that, a living fossil to that. And these buildings still function today. The tower that you see on the left here, this is the city hall, built in 1299, and the mayor still has his offices there in 2020. And here is the cathedral of the city known as the Duomo. And guys, this is the, even though this dome here was finished in 1436, it's still today the biggest, uh, dome with unenforced concrete in all of the world. Can you imagine that? Finished in 1436. So our study center is only a few steps away from these buildings, right here where I have my mouse, if you can see my mouse. And here's what it looks like from the outside. It was built probably around the 1520s. It's known as the Bagnese Palace because that's the family who originally built it and owned it for several hundred years. And you walk through that front door and you get a feel for our atrium where we have our student cafe and student lounge. 
And then you go off to the left here through these columns. And I got a little video here. This is the door that leads you into our library. Here you can see our study pod. And this used to be the old courtyard of the 16th century palace that we turned into our library. You can see that it has these awesome skylights over it. Back in the Renaissance, that was actually open to the sky. Very appropriate state of the art learning facility, but as you can see in the architectural context of the Italian Renaissance. And here is the cooking kitchen where, where we were supposed to give you our demonstration. You don't have to be a pro when you come to FSU Florence, but if you'd like to eat and you want to have a hands-on experience, you could not only do team building activities that have to do with cooking as you learn Italian cuisine and culture, but you could also take a class that will have house in this classroom. Here you can see our associate director, Lucia, whose idea this was. So today we're making our bucatini alla matriciana. And even though today's uh, show is called The Taste of Florence, we're actually not staying in Florence for our dish today. We're jumping on that fast speed train that's called the Red Arrow, the Freccia Rossa, and we're actually heading a little bit south of Florence to an area of Italy. Here you can see Florence up here, to an area of Italy that's called Lazio, which is this area here in the capital of the region of Lazio, so regions basically in Italy are the equivalent of our states. So the region of Lazio's capital is Rome. And why our dish today is called bucatini alla matriciana, you guys know the bucatini is the kind of pasta, we talked about that already, but it's called a matriciana because it was invented in a small little town where you see this red marker here that's called Amatrice. So um, Amatriciana means basically the pasta from this city of Amatrice. It's not really a city, it's sort of like a town. It only has a few thousand inhabitants, but it's famous for its cuisine. And you can see where Amatrice is located, it's sort of in this little conca or this little fertile shell here in between all of these mountains, which is the mountain range that goes down the spine of the boot of Italy. That mountain range is called the Apennines. And going all the way back to the Middle Ages, so the 1100s and the 1200s, the people of Amatrice were very famous for raising sheep and pigs. And sheep and pigs, if you think about it, are the sort of primary sources of this recipe. Because here in Amatrice, and you can see what the town looks like in this photo taken before 2016. With the sheep, of course, sheep you call una pecora in Italian. So this is actually sheep's cheese, pecorino cheese, so cheese of the pec. Pecora. And here you can see the pigs that are uh, raised in that area of Lazio at Amatrice. Well, because the town was so fortunate to have these resources, what they did is many of the people from Amatrice went to Rome, the capital of that region. And one of our excursions that we take at FSU Florence, usually in a spring semester and one of our summer semesters, is of course to Rome. No visit to Italy would be complete without a visit to the eternal city, the city of Rome. This is the Piazza Navona in Rome at night with the famous fountain of the four rivers. And right behind this piazza, was a little street that the Romans actually named Vicolo, that means alley, Vicolo of the people of Amatrice. You can see Vicolo degli Amatriciani. So those that come from 
Amatrice. And here you can see what it looks like today. And when all of those uh, people came down from the mountains to go to Rome to sell their products, they opened up, up shops here. Eventually, if they did good business, they started their own restaurant. And we're actually talking about the 16 and 17 hundred, so pretty long time ago. And it was in Rome where this recipe began to flourish and began to change a little bit. So if you're a local from Amatrice, there's a lot of debate at what is sort of the authentic aspect of the recipe. The people from Amatrice say you can't use bucatini, you have to use spaghetti. But in Rome, you say you can't use spaghetti, you have to use bucatini. So we're gonna do it Roman style today and use bucatini. Same thing with the onion. The people of Amatrice think that if you use an onion, you're uncivilized, you're a barbarian, the dish should be made without an onion. But in Rome, they think the exact opposite. If you make your matriciana without an onion, they think that you're a country bumpkin. A matriciana has to have an onion if it's made in the Roman way, Roman style. So since we're doing Roman style, and that's the way I learned from watching friends and uh, reading, we're gonna use the onion. And now here's the one little variation that we have. The recipe, both, if you're from Amatrice or from Rome, usually uses the part of the pig that's called guanciale. Guanciale, as you can see here, your guancia means your cheek. So it's the pig's cheek that is usually in the recipe. Now, that's hard to find in Tallahassee. And if you do find it in a specialty store, uh, it can be expensive. You'd have to look all over to find it. But a substitute for the guanciale is the belly part of the pig, which is called pancetta. Even your human belly is called a pancha, and the pancella basically is the pork belly. And why I say that if you can't find pancetta that you could use bacon is because bacon also is the pork belly. Only bacon is sort of cured in a different way and it's smoked, whereas pancetta is not. So it has more of that pork flavor. So when you're doing your shopping for this dish, you want to see if you can find pancetta. If you can't find it, even though I wouldn't recommend it, you go with the bacon. The onion we already talked about. Now, part of the, let's say, controversy is this recipe first was codified. So it was first written down in one of the earliest known modern cookbooks. It's called the Modern Apicius, all the way back in 1790 by this guy that you see here. The author was Francesco Leonardo. Guess where he is from? Not Rome, but Amatrice. But he moved to Rome because he became the of the Pope in the Vatican. And it's he that first wrote down the actual recipe. And in the recipe that he wrote down, he had bucatini and um, onions. So we're going to go this way according to that 1790 cookbook. Never, ever, ever use garlic. This is like one, one of the few dishes, Italian dishes, where garlic is a no-no. In fact, a funny story is that I read is that one famous chef in Rome said that he had a secret ingredient that made his amatrichana so much better than everybody else's. And it was found out that he was using garlic as that secret ingredient and he was actually sued by the people of Amatrice in court because he was ruining their, ruining their authentic recipe. So if you don't want to get sued by the people of Amatrice, I think a good idea would be not to use garlic. I never used garlic before. Um, 
don't use it. So, little slideshow, a little presentation. Now let's get back to the good stuff. And I'll stop sharing. Okay. Now, I'm going to move the camera again so that we could start doing our prep. Hopefully that works. I usually start out with the onion. So very easy. You want to make sure that you peel it. So you take off the knobs on either end. And then do a relatively deep sort of cut into the skin on either side. And what that does is it loosens it up and the skin should come off relatively easily. So let's start peeling our onion. You can take it off with your hand like this. Hope the camera is good enough. Let's see, let's make sure we adjust it good. Okay. And you take off your skin, make sure it's all off. Let's get this out of the way. And to cut the onion is pretty easy. You just get it like this, cut it in half, and then you turn the halves over like this and you just go through it first vertically, like that. And then easy, you just turn it around and you could start doing it crossways and you come up with your diced onions. It just takes a couple seconds. Now, if I were cooking this for two people, I'd probably just use about that much right there. So maybe like if you have your small little onion, you don't want too much onions in the sauce, only one small onion. So I think that's enough and I probably won't even use the whole thing. So we'll set this aside for a sandwich or something later. Okay, so the onion is done. Then you want to get your hot pepper. So if you have flakes, you can skip this part. So I'll take out a few. Like I told you guys, I like the fire, so and the tang. So if you just like a little bit of spice, maybe I'd use like one of these. If you like medium, maybe two. And if you like it like I do, maybe I'd go with three or four like that. So cut it up, skin and all. You see some of the seeds start to come out. That's good. It's the same, this is basically, this is the same thing as hot pepper flakes. Now, if you have a fresh hot pepper, make sure it's pretty small, maybe only about this big or so. So if it's really big, cut it down so it's like this size. And you could just, don't cut that whole hot pepper. You could just throw that whole thing into the pan without cutting it. But if you have the dried ones, cut it up like this so that it's like your hot pepper. Okay, that's done. Now we want your pancetta. If you didn't get the pancetta already diced like this in a little plastic container, you could have gotten pancetta that was sliced or you have your bacon as well. This actually isn't bacon, this is pancetta. But you can see how much it looks like bacon, right? So. If you have this, basically you cut it in the same way. You want to cut it into cubes. So you could. Now I'm going to use the ones that we prepared already. So I'm not going to cut too much of this. But you guys can cut your bacon or pancetta if you got it like this instead of the little carton. And the same thing here. You then cut these into cubes very similar to your onions. Okay. So we got our pancetta, we got our hot pepper, and we got our onions. 
So hopefully your water, pasta uh, water is already on. If you don't have it on, put it on now. Mine's already close to boiling. Okay, now the next step would be to, and now we're gonna set the camera up over here so you guys can see the pan. You guys see that? Okay, so olive oil in. Supposed to use about two tablespoons. I never measure anything, so I just sort of judge. So that's about maybe two tablespoons. Just give it a light little coating in the pan. A little extra won't kill you. In fact, it's good for you. So put the olive oil in your pan. Turn the heat on. Probably start, every stove is different, so probably start with uh, medium heat just to see how the ingredients react once they're in the pan. So we start heating your olive oil up. And then you put in your onions. And you put in your hot pepper along with your onions, spread it around a little bit. And then as the heat comes up, and I actually put on the wrong burner, make sure you don't do that at home. This is the first time I'm actually using this kitchen. Okay, so we'll get that going. Now this is a very important step, the onion step, because you don't want them to get too brown. You just want the onions to get a sort of transparent color, not really transparent, but like sort of translucent. Translucent is what you want. You don't want brown or black. It'll give your dish a really sort of bitter taste. So make sure you keep an eye on these as they start sauteing. So we'll let those go for a second. Now, as your water is going, make sure that you want to add a little salt. Now, the pancetta and, and the pecorino cheese are on the salty side. So you don't put that much, you don't put any salt in your sauce. You just put a little bit of salt in your boiling water to sort of take away the blandness of the pasta when you put it in the water. Now, I always use the coarse salt, the big salt. Back once, an ancient Italian lady, about 120 years old, said to me that you use coarse salt for cooking, for your water, for meats, for your sauces, and the fine salt, the table salt that you put in the shakers, well, that's for, you know, if you need a little extra at the table to dress your food. Get your wooden spoon, as this begins cooking up. All right, I'm seeing how it reacts now, so I'm putting the heat down a little bit. So, just grab up like a pinch of salt, no more than a pinch, and throw it in your water. Maybe a second one of your coarse salt will do the trick. If you only have fine salt, that's all right too. Maybe do like three little pinches of salt and put it in your pasta water. Okay, you can see that the onion is starting to go, mixing with the olive oil and the hot peppers. Remember, keep it moving. Keep the onions in the olive oil moving while you're going, because you don't want it to get black or burn in any way. 
And you can see that gradually it's starting to get a little transparent. In fact, I think that we're almost there. You can see how quick it takes. And since I never used the stove, it's a little hard for me to judge the first time around, but I think it's coming pretty good. Okay. Once you get that translucent feel to your onions, this is the time to put your pancetta. So take your little cubes of pancetta and you add them to the mix. If you have to cut up the slices, I cut up a few, I'm not gonna waste them obviously, it's really good stuff. You have the bacon, throw those in too. Okay. Watch out if the pot gets too dry and things start sticking, you might wanna add a little bit more olive oil, the Italian gold. And what you want to do here too is sort of the same process. Spread the pancetta out a little bit in your pan. And you wanna basically wait until the pancetta now becomes sort of that translucent, gets that translucent quality to it. So while it's getting that translucent quality. I know that you guys in the state probably don't have tomato cans with a pop top. So I don't know why that hasn't made it yet to America. But if you have your, your can of tomatoes, open it with your can opener. So I'll just pop this bad boy open like this. So make sure that then your tomatoes are ready to go. Let's keep an eye on the pancetta. It's getting there. Maybe another minute or so. Now I first learned how to make this dish when I was your guy's age, when I studied abroad in 1994, when I was 20, how old was I back then? 21 years old. In fact, I just turned 21 last week. And that's why I could use the wine to dress this sauce and you guys can't. But anyway, I live with this Italian family. They're called the Bortolotti and the matriarch of the family was Mama Bortolotti, and she would cook for the study abroad students that lived in her house. Now, this was actually after our program was over. I did the spring 1994 program, and I loved it here so much that I decided to stay a few extra months in the summer on my own. So I went to live with Mama Bortolotti's family, and I remember every time we were in the kitchen or she was in the kitchen, I'd make a point of it of pulling up a chair and watching her cook. And this is the first time that I saw matriciana being made. You guys come study abroad. I'm sure you'll have experience like this that lasts with you a life. Okay, I think our pancetta is getting that sort of translucent feel to it, that color. So we should be nearing the time, the moment of truth. Okay, this is when you get your cooking wine or regular wine. First, make sure you have a little taste. Salute, pretty good, okay. You're going to pour your glass of wine into 
the mixture. It should sizzle a little bit. And that's what you want. Okay. So make it sizzle, make it smoke like that. And you'll see the steam that's coming up. You'll know when to go on to the next step by, now don't burn your face off when you do this, but you put your nose, and if you have a big honker like I do, a Roman nose, why do they call it a Roman nose? Because it's Roman all over your face. You stick your nose over the steam, and if you still smell the wine smell, it's not ready yet. So you want to make it cook the safety thing kicked in on the oven so it turned off to <laughs> turn it back on. Okay, so you want to make it cook until when you stick your nose over it and smell the steam, make sure you don't burn your face off. And when you don't smell, mix it together, make sure that the wine soaks in with the onion and the pancetta. Smell it again. Now it's starting to saute and fry again a little bit more so it's better. I remember Mama Bortolotti putting her nose over it, smelling it, and I said, what are you doing? And she told me that that was the trick. Because when you don't smell the wine smell anymore, you know that all the alcohol has evaporated, and that's the time to add the tomatoes. So I have my can of tomatoes here and throw them in the mixture. If you have peel, they should come out like this. Nice big lumps. And get your wooden spoon and break open if you got the peeled tomatoes. So all the juices and all that goodness, all that tang comes out. Now, hopefully your pasta water is boiling by now. Mine is. And you mix these all together. And I keep it on a relatively high flame until it starts to bubble. Then when it starts to bubble, I put it down low and let it simmer. Because while you cook your bucatini in the boiling water, that's just enough time for the pasta to cook. So you can see that starting to bubble right here. Turn it down a little bit. Now your water should be boiling, has the coarse salt in it, and it's time for the bucatini. I don't think in my life I've ever looked at the time, how much it takes to cook. The times are never right. So open up your box of bucatini or spaghetti if you have it, that's fine too. Sorry if you're getting seasick with the camera, but you know, we have to make do over here. So you have your bucatini, open them up, and now is the time to put them in the pasta. Never break it in half. That's American style. We wanna keep them nice and long so it soaks up all that nice juice of the sauce. Obviously, if they stick up out of your pan, uh, your pot a little bit, you want to 
push them down. So you push them down with your wooden spoon into the water. Sorry, you guys can see I'm not a, a movie cinema major. So we'll put these down into the water. Now, how do I know when my bucatini are done? I'll know just by tasting them. So every so often, I'll give them a little taste. Good, so they're in there. When they soften up a little bit, just give them a little whirl. Make sure you keep mixing also your sauce. Okay, not only is it the perfect time while the sauce is simmering, your pasta is boiling in the pot, now is the time to grate your cheese, your pecorino. So you want to eventually, while everything is cooking, make sure you keep an eye on everything as well. Because you don't want this to stick. Give your pasta a little twirl in there so it starts breaking up, loosening up. So in the time that it takes the pasta to cook, you do the cheese step. So you grab your cheese, and everybody knows how the great cheese, right? Because I was worried a little bit about the time, I already pre-grated some, as you can see here. If you bought Pecorino grated, you're already ahead of the game, so that's good. I would grate, if you look, about, once again, I barely measure something, you just go sort of by sight and taste, if you have experience. I would grate about two, two and a half handfuls of your pecorino cheese. So there I have about two handfuls. Maybe I'll just get a little more. Also, this grater is not the best, so I thought it would take forever if we graded it together. So while your sauce is simmering on low and your pasta is boiling, Got to get the timing right, right? You grate your cheese. So that should be about two and a half handfuls. Okay, a little bit more. Awesome. All right. Now, a trick is, is that if you notice that the tomato sauce is getting Sort of a little too thick, a little too dry. You could always get a ladle and just put a little bit of the water that your pasta is boiling in, like this, into the mixture to loosen it up a little bit. But usually, if you simmer it at the right temperature, you don't have too high of a heat. Uh, you don't have to do that. But if that does happen to you, you could just loosen it up with a little water from the, from the pasta. Okay, so you probably still need some time to grate some cheese. So why don't you keep doing that? <clears throat> we, let's see if we can see my face here. Okay, not that. It's a great face to look at. Okay. God, I don't know how many of you guys know this, but FSU Florence is one of the oldest uh, American institutions in Italy. We were founded in 1966. And up until now, we've been with a semester by semester presence in the city for all these years, for 54 years. So we really have a long standing 
tradition in not just the city of Florence, but also in Italy. And this will be actually the fourth study center that we have. Our very first year in 1966, which was like a trial year, our study center was actually a hotel. And then the year after that, we moved into an urban villa. It was called the Villa Fabricotti, which for many years uh, since we moved out has been used as offices. It's become sort of run down. But I just read recently that the Villa Fabricotti, FSU's old home, uh, in the late 60s and throughout the 1970s, is going to be renovated and turned into a museum. So all of our alumni who actually had their study center there could finally go back and visit it after all these years. It's going to be actually a photo, photo, photography museum, the Alinari Museum. Alinari is one of the most historical uh, photographic houses in all of Italy. And they have something like uh, half a million photographs uh, from the invention of pho photography in the mid to late 1800s uh, all the way up to the 21st century. So that should be exciting. Then our third study center was actually a place that we leased in downtown Florence, steps away from where our new one is, on a street called the Borgo degli Albizzi, which if you guys are an alum, uh, that's the place where you had your classes and your experience. And beginning in 2018, Florida State bought for the first time in our history, we own our residence. Once again, thanks to Lucia, she did a lot of the wheeling and dealing. I can never uh, deal with Italian bureaucracy like she did. Plus, she knows not just the literal language that everybody speaks. I speak Italian, but not like a native. And all of sort of intricacies that it takes to do such a thing with the support of internet national programs and their ideas, as well as uh, FSU in general, we're able to get this place and make it our new home, the Palazzo Bagnese. And it's on this really cool street that's called the Via dei Neri. And the Via dei Neri is sort of steps away from the medieval city hall, steps away from the river, the famous bridge here in Florence is called the Ponte Vecchio. And what's cool about that street is if you like food and you like cuisine, that street is one of the most famous for foodies that come from all over the world just to walk up and down that street and take and taste all of those delicacies. And that's where we have our new study center. The pictures that you saw. Pasta should be nearing completion. So you saw that I was sort of uh, filibustering there, ad living as we move along. Make sure that that sauce doesn't stick. Don't burn your hand off when you try it. Now, you probably heard of that phrase al dente before. Aristocrat, right? That's how all Italians like to eat their pasta al dente. Literally means to the tooth. So when you cook your pasta, sort of, means to the tooth, al dente means firm to the bite, firm to the tooth. So can't be too hard. Obviously it can't be overcooked and be really soft and mushy like a lot of times that you get at the Olive Garden. No way, an Italian would freak out. You want it to be al dente, so just the perfect firmness. So you keep tasting your bucatini, spaghetti, or whatever pasta without burning yourself. I have chef hands and calluses, so I don't burn that easily. Take a nice taste. I mean, sometimes it's really a matter of seconds. So you have to keep tasting it over and over again. That's why when you read the minutes on the pasta box, sometimes they could be deceiving. 
You want to get it just right. So constantly after like seven or eight minutes pass, nine minutes with your bucatini, you want to sort of keep tasting a strand like every 30 seconds or so. Okay, see, mine's starting to thicken up a little, thicken up a little bit, my sauce. So this is where we want to add in a little water. Make it loosen up a little bit. That's enough. Let's bring the camera a little closer. Hopefully you're almost done grating your cheese. Remember, we wanted like about two and a half big handfuls of cheese. Okay. I think these bucatini are gonna be ready right now. Let's try one last one. I think it's gonna be al dente. Let's try it. Mm. Perfect. See? So if you test one like every 30 seconds, there's no way you can mess up the cooking. Just so it's nice and firm to your tooth. Now, time to take the pasta off. So I'm turning everything off right here so we don't burn everything, anything. And grab your pot holders, don't burn yourself. I'm gonna be off camera now. So I'm gonna grab the pasta water. And I know you guys are looking at the sauce right now. So let me lift this up. There's the pasta water. It's ready. You taste, we tasted it. It's ready to go. Give it one last taste to make sure it's all right. Don't burn yourself. Still perfect. Okay. But you can't leave it on any longer because it'll get too mushy. So let's dump this in our calm over here in the sink. Watch out for all the steam that comes out. Now, if you're cooking for two, you know, the whole box might be a little too much. I'm a big eater, so I made a lot, but you probably don't have to use all this. Now, this is a really interesting step that probably a lot of people don't do, but you're going to want to, you know, don't use all, so take out a little. I already took out a little myself and left it in a second colander in the sink over there. So you want to put then, when the bucatini is ready, you want to put the bucatini into your sauce like this. Just pour it right over it. Perfect, I think that would be enough for two people. So I'll have dinner tonight, six hour time difference, and maybe lunch tomorrow with my matrichana. So I turned all the heat off, the bucatini resting on top of the tomatoes, the sauce, and this is when you put your pecorino cheese. So you grab one handful, Pecorino, sprinkle it over the top, grab your second handful. And why I always say two and a half is because you wanna leave a half a handful to put on top after you plate it. So you got your two and a half handfuls in there. And what's happening obviously is that the cheese is beginning to melt and it's sort of going to embrace, and hug the tomato sauce, and the bucatini. And this is when you grab your wooden spoon and if you have something else and begin to turn it over and mix it together. And you'll see how the cheese just melts with the tomato, with the pancetta and basically the dish once everything is melted and mixed to perfection is done. Now, in my excitement of teaching you guys this and blabbering on about FSU Florence, before the sauce is done, you're supposed to add a little black pepper. So I'm gonna add a little now, no big deal. So I'm gonna skip that step. So we just mix it in there. Perfect. And it's ready. It's ready to go. 
So, got my dish over here. Let's move the camera back. Oh, you guys can see this awesome decor, high class, expensive uh, uh, painting that I put up for a backdrop today. Have to, you know, always have our identity shine through even when we're making bucatini. And it's ready, so I'm gonna get the dish. If you have a pasta scooper, you could use that. I always just like to use my ladle and wooden spoon for balance. Get it up in there and make sure you don't make a mess. That's okay, we're in Italy, we can make a mess. Scoop it into the dish. Make sure you get that nice sauce and tomatoes put on top. Mix it together a little more. Some of that on top of that. Make sure it's nice mixed before you serve it so that all the cheese is melted together, almost like creamy effect. I think I want a little more pancetta and honey. Good. And you have your bucatini al amatri shana. I brought everything except my fork, but a good chef. But I'm not a chef. Good cook always tastes before he serves it to his friends. So let's see if we could at least get a little bite here on the wooden spoon. Mm, delicious. Needs a little pecorino on the top. Ah, the spice is just right too. Hard to eat with a wooden spoon, but just make sure the taste is right. Great. So, specialty of Rome, but invented in the little town of Amatrice, ported to Rome probably in the 1600s. And Romans had their own variation on it by adding the red onion and using bucatini instead of spaghetti. So that's it. Hope you have a good lunch and we're done. Thank you so much, Frank. That was incredible. This meal looks delicious. For those of y'all that actually um, cooked along with Frank and created a delicious lunch, Definitely take a picture, tag FSUIP. We would love to feature that on our Instagram. Let us see what you made. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, for this A Dash of Florence cooking show. Um, we do have some other events happening throughout the week. We will definitely drop that link in the chat if you would like to register for any of the other links and tune in for the other activities that we have going on. But huge thank you to Frank. Thank you for leading this cooking show. It was amazing. And thank you to all of y'all for joining us. How bad does my camera work? You had some great angles, for sure. Well done. <laughs> that means it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, it was great. It was great. Um, I know we are at a little bit over time, so we want to be mindful. Oh, but anyone uh, who would like to stick around, you are welcome to. And we can do a little bit of Q&A if y'all have some questions for Frank or anything. But if you uh, need to run, no worries. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we will talk to you soon.